it's a huge pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. I've just uh, come down from Utah where I met with um, a very large group of very conservative people who are of, in many ways, a like mind with you on where this country is going, particularly in respect of vaccination and vaccination mandates, and that's something I want to discuss today. Um, I imagine the majority of you are Texans, although I don't know, and Texas is, at least for now, a safe haven compared with other states in this country. California has become the most coercive, and one of the speakers I spoke to said become the most fascist state in the world in terms of vaccine mandate, segregation from public and private education, if you do not follow to the letter the CDC's mandate. And we will reflect today upon the CDC and the integrity of that infrastructure. Whistleblowing in the public interest. Let's see if we can get this to work. Where is autism going? Let's use the CDC's data to start with. And um, if we can trust that, let's look at what has happened. Autism, we must assume, is a new disease. We must assume that the prevalence of autism before 1930, for example, was zero. Now, why do I say this? The best diagnosticians in medicine were not even of the last century. The people who described the great human pathologies, diseases, were people like Charcot in Paris in the late 19th century, and people working under him like Pierre Marie and UK physicians who were outstanding at describing disease syndromes. They could do very little to actually treat them effectively, but as clinicians, their ability to take a history and to observe and to describe those diseases, whether it was neurosyphilis or whatever, was outstanding and certainly far, far better than clinicians trained in medicine today who defer default to testing rather than even asking the patient fundamental question about what ails them. So had autism, had a condition as enigmatic, as idiosyncratic, as fascinating, as autism existed, it would have been described, and yet it was not until the 1940s. So let us assume that historically, the prevalence of this disease was zero. And it remained at extremely low levels to the extent that in 1981, when I graduated in medicine, I had not been taught anything about autism other than the fact that I would probably never see a case in my entire career. In the textbook which was given to me by uh, an elderly teacher, retired teacher. It was about childhood development and abnormalities thereof. And in that book, there was no mention of autism. This was the Bible by which the teachers were trained on uh, childhood development. But the word had been used, there had been mentions, and so she said to her teacher, excuse me, what is this syndrome, what is autism? It's not in our book. And he said, don't worry, my dear, you will never see a case in your lifetime. And the case that she saw, of course, was her own grandson. So, it has gone in the 1970s from a prevalence of 1 in 10,000, a rare disorder, now to following an exponential increase, according to the CDC's data, such that the risk for autism in a child born today, based upon these data, is one in 25. One in 25 children. And there is absolutely nothing to suggest that this curve is going to be attenuated in any way whatsoever. It is going to continue into the future if nothing changes. So where does that go to? Well, I recently interviewed for a documentary we're making about the CDC whistleblower a senior scientist at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And she is an expert in artificial intelligence and computer science. And she presented to us this observation that if you log 
that exponential trend, you can look into the future and predict when this disorder is going to affect one in two children, and that is in 2032. She believes it will happen even sooner because the shape of this curve is changing and the environmental factors that she believes, and I believe, are conspiring to produce this syndrome are actually on the increase. So we are looking at a vertical acceleration of this new disorder. One in two children. What does a country look like with one in two children? You are either affected or you care for someone who is affected. There is no standing army. There is no police force. There is no school. There are no teachers. There is nothing. And this sort of apocalyptic view of the world is almost too much for people to imagine. And so, in this sort of dissonant way, we dismiss it. Look, the world's going on around us, we drive to work, we can go to Starbucks. Where's the problem? The problem is right here in the numbers. These are real. What we have here is an observation bias, because clearly we don't see too many children with autism except in our professional practice. Why? Because there is an observation bias. They are not out there in the community. They are not. They're at home because out in the community, they're not safe. They're not safe. And so this is a hidden hoard of an epidemic that is all too real. And this is what the future actually looks like. So not something we can walk away from. This is the Environmental Protection Agency's own study on the incidence of autism worldwide. This is fascinating. So the incidence, the number of new cases presenting year on year in the susceptible population here presented by year of birth. And in the top we have different countries, Japan, Denmark and the US, and in the bottom the aggregated data for worldwide incidence. And there's a very telling story that was picked up by the scientists who published this paper. And that is you go from this low prevalence situation to a hockey stick effect. Where children born, the birth cohorts from 1998-99 were where it started. You can actually pinpoint to two years, two birth cohorts, where this epidemic started. And the fascinating thing is that it started in the same, at the same time around the world. In these developed countries around the world, the inflection was at the same point. And what that tells us is, one, this must be environmental. You do not have genetic epidemics. Number two, that the environmental impact, whether it was one factor or a set of constrained factors that conspired to produce this increase, was the same, or operated at the same time in different countries around the world. And in terms of narrowing down, therefore, what those environmental factors might be, that is extremely helpful because they must have been introduced into different countries around the world within those two birth cohorts, 1988-89. And let me tell you, that in Denmark and Japan and the UK, that is when the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine was introduced. That was when there was a massive acceleration in the immunization practices here in the United States with the introduction of Hib and hepatitis B at birth and, of course, a very high load of thimerosal, the mercury preservative, in those vaccines. So, this is a very telling graph. My story starts with this. In 1995, May the 19th, I was an academic gastroenterologist practicing at the Royal Free Hospital in London, which was part of the biggest medical school in the world, the University of London. And I had a moderately successful career and ran a, a large team looking at inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, looking at environmental causation and measles virus in particular. I got a call from a mother who said, my child was developing perfectly normally. He had speech interaction with his sibling. He was meeting all his milestones. I took him for his MMR vaccine. And in England at the time, we gave the MMR in isolation. 
So it was given at 15 to 18 months. And therefore, parents were able to pinpoint that vaccine in isolation. She said he had the vaccine and he had a fever. He became very drowsy for three to four days. And when he woke up, he was never the same again. The lights in his eyes had gone out. And we hear this description by mothers so commonly. The lights had simply gone out. And I said, I'm terribly sorry. I know absolutely nothing about autism. I'm a gastroenterologist. How can I possibly help? And she said, my child has terrible gastrointestinal problems. And the doctor says that his diarrhea, 10 to 12 times a day, his abdominal pain, his distension, his failure to thrive, his falling off his centile charts for weight and height, that's just autism. No, it wasn't. That doctor was not listening. And as a gastroenterologist, I was fascinated because, of course, this is typical of the childhood presentation of something like celiac or Crohn's disease. And so I decided to look at this uh, with a team comprising John Walker-Smith, who was at that time the world's leading pediatric gastroenterologist. We're a team of 13 people, psychiatrists, neurologists, but the world's leading pediatric gastroenterologist, a man who was the founding father of the discipline worldwide, a man who um, writes the textbook that teaches pediatric gastroenterologists around the world. I want you to bear that in mind. It's extremely important as we go forward with this. And we decided to investigate these gastrointestinal problems. One, because they were real, they were common, and she said, Doctor, I'm, many, many parents are in touch with me describing exactly the same thing in their children. There is an epidemic of this particular problem. And so, having heard these stories from parents, we decided to put this team together to investigate this particular issue. And this is the paper that came out of it. It's a case series. Case series is extremely important. This is the way in which human disease syndromes are first described. A handful of patients who present with such a consistent and idiosyncratic pattern of signs and symptoms that they merit publication in their own right. This is the way in which Crohn's disease was described, or Asperger's syndrome in four boys, or uh, autism in 11 children, or multiple sclerosis, or AIDS. This is how human disease syndromes are first described. They can't test hypotheses. These are not hypotheses testing studies. They are simply saying, this is what we hear, this is what we see, this is what we find. And here are our, our ideas. This is what we believe is the way forward in testing whether or not this is real and what is triggering it. That is a case series. It is a humble iteration of the parent's story and little more. And this paper was published in 1998. And I told my colleagues at the time that in light of the parent's story, I had gone away and done a study, a research, on the pre-licensing safety studies of measles, measles rubella and measles mumps rubella vaccines worldwide. I'd written a 250-page report, and I was appalled by the inadequacy of the safety studies. They were much better for the single measles vaccine, but for the MMR, they were largely an assumption. We have a license for measles, we have a license for mumps, we have a license for rubella. Let's put them together, one and one and one equals three. There's going to be no problem. You're dealing with live biological agents, subtle, clever, collective intelligence of viruses is, is enormous. They're, des they're designed to survive. They will survive. So the notion that you could simply take three viruses and put them into the same shot and expect no adverse consequences was alarming to me. It was so naive. And so I said to my colleagues, look, I can no longer support the combined MMR vaccine. I will continue to advocate for the use of the single vaccine, particularly for measles, but I cannot support the use of the MMR. And this was clearly going to attract public attention, media attention. The dean wanted a press conference, and so we went forward and had that press conference, and I wrote to them all, giving the dean of the medical school the opportunity to say, no press conference, this is too controversial, or Wakefield is banned from the press conference, or if the question is asked, I'll direct it to someone else. When the paper came out, 
There was a press conference. I was there, and he directed the question straight to me. And I told the media and those present exactly what I said I would say. And that was the beginning of the end of my career. However, what has happened in the meantime is a sideshow. The intervening years have been a sideshow, and they're a sideshow to divert attention from gross regulatory failure, and we will discuss that today, to protect individuals and government, but most importantly, to protect the industry from past liabilities and to protect future profits. You read the Wall Street Journal, vaccination, vaccine production, is the future of the pharmaceutical industry. You can only, well, most of the drugs are now going off patent, they're going to generics, there's no money in that, you can only sell so much Viagra. So, the future, <laughs> with an annual 14% year-on-year growth, is in vaccine production. There are 270 new vaccines going through development and licensing at the moment, many of which will find their way onto mandatory schedules for children and adults. So even if you are happy, and as I know many of you are not, with the current immunization schedule, just imagine what the world is going to look like when 270 new vaccines are forced upon you. This is Professor John Walker Smith, as I told you, led the clinical investigation of these sick children. His team, along with me, recognized that these children had an inflammatory bowel disease, a novel inflammatory bowel disease which was amenable to intervention. Dietary intervention, removal of gluten and casein from the diet, had a dramatic effect in these children. Not only were their gastrointestinal problems alleviated, but their autistic symptoms got better. And that was fascinating. Now, it could have simply been that these children were feeling better because they were out of pain. They were clearly in pain, even though they couldn't articulate that. They couldn't tell anyone because they'd lost the ability to speak. But there was something more than that. They started speaking where they had left off all those years ago, starting this, using the same words. So we had been told that this was a dead-end disorder. You've got it, that's brain damage fixed for life. And yet what we were seeing in the clinic is something completely different. And my belief, and I am not a fan of psychiatry. In fact, that is something of an understatement. Child psychiatrists really have, have put a roadblock in the way of our understanding of this disorder for so long, for whatever reason, territorial or otherwise. I don't care, but they need to get out of the way. This disorder was nothing that they described. It wasn't genetic. It wasn't in the mind. It wasn't psychological. It wasn't the mother's fault, the refrigerator mother. It wasn't a low prevalence disorder, and it was treatable, and it was understandable, and my belief is it didn't start in the brain. Now, what happened was Rupert Murdoch's News International put a journalist called Brian Deere onto us in order to, he was asked to find something big on MMR, undo what we had done. Suspend belief for a moment and just imagine it takes about five minutes to destroy a scientist's career and a lifetime to rebuild it. This story isn't about me. I'm not going to dwell on that at all, except to say that this man was involved. So imagine there were 13 authors on that paper. They had published 5,000 papers between them. These were senior people, the leading people in the country and in some cases the world in their field. Were they really going to let me, one man, fabricate a paper which they knew was going to get into the public domain and cause huge controversy without doing due diligence and reading the clinical records that they had made and reporting the bowel disease that they had observed down the colonoscope and the microscope. Was that really going to happen? And yet, the word of Brian Deere, a journalist with no medical training, no scientific training whatsoever, was pitted against the word of this man and the scientific community Public Health chose to believe Brian Deere. Well, John Walker Smith appealed after our licenses had been removed. I appealed, but I couldn't afford to pursue it in the English High Court. It would have cost me 500,000 pounds. 
But the first time this ever went before a judiciary and he appealed his dismissal. Then this is what happened. Now bear in mind, we had been accused by Brian Deere of experimenting on children, of doing studies without ethical approval, of doing it to propagate a lawsuit, and all of this. This is what the judge said was the first time this ever came before a proper judiciary. This is what he said of the General Medical Council, which is like the state licensing board. There were fundamental errors in their interpretation of evidence. There was distortion of evidence, inadequate analysis, inadequate and superficial reasoning and explanation, inappropriate rejection of evidence, flawed and wrong reasoning, and numerous and significant inadequacies. Universal inadequacies and some errors on the panel's determination accordingly go to the heart of the case. They are not curable. The panel's determination cannot stand. I therefore quash it. That is what happened to the case against us. Did this make it into the media? No. Everything that we did was ethical and approved, but that didn't matter because the British government and the pharmaceutical industry and News International got what they want. And that was to silence doctors for the years that followed and to prevent them doing their job in the interests of these children because they were terrified that they would, in what has now become the common vernacular, they would be wakefielded. Okay, so medicine and science have been cursed into silence by this fear. And so what happened to me was to encourage the others. This is what will happen to you if you get involved in this. And to discredit the vaccine association because the bowel disease was synonymous with vaccine injury, then thousands and thousands of children have in the intervening years not been investigated, not been treated, been allowed to suffer in pain, to be given psychotropic drugs, to be put in institutions, in many cases to be killed by their parents in murder-suicide efforts because parents can no longer bear to see their children suffering in pain. This is Brian Deere on himself. Now, when he accused us of fraud, we took a case in defamation out against him in Travis County Court in Austin, Texas, where I now live. And we were denied jurisdiction, ultimately, but we did gain access to some very important documents. And here is an exchange, just an example, this is an exchange between Brian Deere and the editor of the British Medical Journal who allowed his papers to run. And this is the kind of objectivity that they are looking for in their writers. This is Deere on himself. I freely admit to being semi-notorious for packing into single, highly readable, and apparently bland sentences, rat's nests of complexity and implication. Okay, that is the objectivity that they are looking for in their writers. Dear on parents, if you ever thought that this man was operating out of altruism, read this. This is on the website. The festering, this is on ch the parents of children with autism. The festering nastiness, the creepy repetitiveness, the weasley, deceitful obsessiveness all signal pathology to me, and they wonder why their children have problems with their brain. This is the man in whom science and medicine have invested their faith, and they are welcome to him. So, this is the kind of child that we would see at the Royal Free. This is a little boy who was seen and scoped there. This child is physically sick physically sick. He has a grossly distended abdomen. He has no muscle mass. He may even have early rickets. He is clearly unwell. He looks like a famine victim from West Africa. But his problem is all in the mind. Who is the person in this family under investigation? The mother, exactly, for starving her child. This is the dilemma that medicine and child psychiatry has got itself into. Displacing the blame onto someone else because of their inadequacy and their failure. But the picture belies that because behind him is his sister, who is perfectly healthy and perfectly well nourished. And when you see bowel disease, and while we may have differences of opinion on how you might approach the treatment of that, this child is physically sick. This little boy would do this for hours a day. The child psychiatrist said this is just autism. This is just repetitive behaviors. No, it's not. This is totally appropriate behavior for a child 
who is suffering abdominal pain. He's putting pressure on his abdomen to relieve that pain. It is totally appropriate, but because he's lost the ability to articulate that, to tell his mother what is wrong with him, this is what he does. This little boy would sleep like this. This little boy would sleep with his head on his little doggy there to alleviate the abdominal pain. Why do we know this? Because when he was scoped and his inflammatory bowel disease was treated, he didn't do this anymore. He went to bed and slept normally. This is self-injury. This little boy would try to render himself unconscious to escape the abdominal pain from which he was suffering. Now, this child came to see Dr. Krigsman in uh, Austin and was driven down. And on the way, he was in such distress that they stopped in an ER. Can you imagine taking this child into an ER? Can you imagine the potential consequences of that? Fortunately, the ER physician had himself an autistic son and recognized immediately what was going on, alleviated his pain temporarily, and sent him on his way. It could have ended very, very differently. This little boy is trying to kill himself. This is self-injury in a child with autism who is trying to end his life because his suffering is too great. He likewise has inflammatory bowel disease. People say to me, autism is just the new normal. It's, um, it's a blessing. This is what I see on a daily basis. And this is what I've seen for the last 20 years. So please don't tell me that this is the new normal or this is in any way acceptable. And this is why I will never quit this fight, never. <laughs> We are surrounded by ironies as well because this boy's father is a senior executive in the firm Wyeth that produces thimerosal, the mercury preservative. Gastrointestinal disorder is now the most common finding, the most consistent finding in worldwide medical research, the link between the gastrointestinal tract and autism, and in particular now the gut flora, the bacterial flora of the intestine. This is just a paper from UC Davis. Our data clearly show that gastrointestinal problems are very common in children with autism. It is a body disorder, whole body disorder. It is in the gut primarily. Why? Because it's an immune system disorder, and 75% of the body's immune system is in the gut. There is so much we don't know, but so many clues that have been provided by parents that we need to pursue. Why are they in pain? This is a capsule enteroscopy image of uh, a child's intestine. This comes from Federico Balzola in Italy, who'd written a paper on this. This is that little pill cam that you swallow. It goes through the small intestine, and you can see inflammation and ulceration very clearly that you would find, you would find consistent with Crohn's disease. But this is not Crohn's. It is something subtly different. This is from Japan. This is a worldwide problem. This is duodenal ulceration that would have you and I screaming on the floor in pain. This is in a patient with autism. These these plaques of um, fibrin over ulcer ulcerated areas. So this is a worldwide problem. When I left the Royal Free, we published many papers on this, not just the Lancet paper, but we've gone into that hypothesis testing mode to characterize this disorder and distinguish it from classical inflammatory bowel disease um, and look at its idiosyncrasies. And so a lot of work had been done. No one ever talks about these. It's about the first paper they discuss. So we're left with this fascinating observation that there is a link between the bowel and the brain. Something in the bowel is influencing the brain, whether it's gut bacteria or the diet or all of these things influencing the immune system, the barrier function uh, that is in some way impacting the brain. And the chief medical officer in England many, many years ago, who is the equivalent of the Surgeon General, said to me, I just don't get this gut-brain link. And I said to him, okay, let, I'll take you for a beer. I'll buy you a beer and in 15 minutes, you'll get it. <laughs> and he, he thought that I wanted to buy him a beer for social reasons. I can't stand the man. <laughs> he didn't get it. I'm trying to explain to him how a neurotoxin from the gut can influence the brain, even his brain.
but he didn't get it. This is not rocket science. Not rocket science. So, the important thing about this is the parents were right. Fundamental rule of clinical medicine, listen to the patient or the parents. No one knows a child like their mother, but medicine knows better in its infinite arrogance and ignorance. Medicine has dismissed what the parents said and been completely and utterly wrong about this disease. It's time to relearn those fundamental tenets of clinical medicine and go back to listening to the parents. We are here on this earth now, not because of public health, not because of medicine. We are here on this earth right now, as we are, because of maternal instinct most powerful force in the world. Mothers know when their children are well, they know when they're ill. If we do not listen to that, then we will go horribly, horribly wrong, as we have done here. Disorder in the bowel is real, common, and treatable. And that's it. So when the parents say that my child has gastrointestinal problems, I believe it's due to a disease, and they turn out to be right. When they say they regressed after an MMR vaccine, then we take that very, very seriously. Except that's not what happened. So if the child regressed after catching natural chicken pox at a friend's party, we'd say, gosh, that's a terrible disorder. We need to, uh, we need to uh, produce a vaccine against chicken pox immediately. But because it's a vaccine, its name cannot be spoken. Well, to hell with that. Okay? Because medicine is about acting in the patient's interests and not in the interests of public health or the pharmaceutical industry. And yet this went into abeyance for a long, long time. And nothing would have changed. Nothing would have changed at all. We would see that inexorable increase in this disorder. And medicine gives you the sharp end. Medicine gives you the worst cases first. So you see autism first. But what if what we were doing to these children was just shaving five points off the IQ of every boy and girl in the country? How long would that take to recognize? It took Needleman 20 years to convince people that lead in gasoline and paint was neurotoxic. 20 years. He was berated by the petrochemical industry and others. Now, oh yeah. Oh yeah, we know that. But that's what it took, 20 years of fighting. And what we saw was an increase in the average IQ of children around the country, an increase in college boards, examinations, as a consequence of removal of that. Now it's going down again. Now it's going down again. So let me put it to you that what we are seeing is merely the tip of the iceberg of the damage that is being done environmentally to the children of the world. And all of this, as I say, would have remained the same were it not for one man. And that one man is Dr. William Thompson from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. In 2000, I went to Dan Burton's committee, the Government Reform Committee, to testify before Congress on the vaccine autism connection, and I described the early findings that I've shown you. And we, one of the questions we asked ourselves is why not all children? Why do just some children develop autism? And we were interested in pattern of exposure, and in particular age of exposure. Putting MMR together, yes, that was one, but age of exposure was another way. The timing of exposure to an infectious agent determines the outcome. So if you get measles under one, the risk of an adverse reaction is greater than if you get it over one. Why? It's intuitive. The immune system is more developed. You have, um, you have a greater risk of an adverse event if your immune system is unable to cope with an equal dose of infection, for example. So there are logical reasons to assume and practical reasons to recognize, because it happens, that younger age of exposure may alter the risk of an infectious agent. So it comes to this issue of the soil rather than infection, that it is the state of the person who's getting the infection that largely determines the outcome. And so we put this to Congress and we put it to the CDC and they went away and they tested the hypothesis that younger age of exposure to MMR vaccine was a risk for autism. That's what they tested in the Atlanta metro area and that is what they found. And that is what they hid for 13 years. They had these data in 2001. 
They went back before Congress in 2002, they went back to in 2004, and they kept these data from Congress and the world. And in the paper they published in 2004, there was no mention of it. MMR vaccine was safe. They went to the Institute of Medicine, they reported that MMR vaccine was safe. Um, let me take you back a bit to William Thompson. William Thompson was an epidemiologist and statistician at the CDC. He's still there because he's protected by whistleblower laws. And he was the lead on this study in a, in a money laundering outfit. William Thompson would be the accountant. Okay? He would be the guy with the skills, the data, and the software. He would be the last person you want negotiating with the feds. And he performed this study. He did the analysis. In 2001, he found there was a clear relationship between age of exposure to MMR. If you got it on schedule between 12 and 15 months compared to those getting it after three years, there was an elevated, a significantly elevated risk of autism. He then went on to break it down into subgroups. And he found that there were two subgroups at very high risk. One was African-American boys and the other were children, irrespective of race, who were developmentally normal for the first year of life. That is a whole lot of children who were susceptible to this disorder. And that was a group they called isolated autism. There, was no, there, was, there were no um, auditory or visual problems. There was no uh, mental retardation as judged by an IQ less than 70. There was no cerebral palsy. There was isolated autism. And he told his colleagues about these, and they spent the intervening years seeking to cover it up. He said, when the CDC finds something that they don't like, they go into a room and they do not come out of that room until they have got rid of that effect. These are his words. That is the way in which CDC handles vaccine safety science. And what he gave to us, what he presented initially to Dr. Brian Hooker, a scientist from Redding, California, and the father of a vaccine-damaged child, were all of the serial data outputs, all of the original analysis plans that they were meant to follow, that they did not follow, all of the internal email communications and correspondence between William Thompson and his colleagues, trying to alert them to the seriousness of this finding and the consistency of this finding, emails between him and Julie Gerberding as head of the CDC telling her about these findings, emails to Walter Orenstein, who was head of the National Immunization Program, and a man deeply invested in MMR vaccine, telling him about these findings. And they all ignored him. In fact, they didn't ignore him. He was destined to present to the Institute of Medicine in 2004, and he wrote to Julie Gerberding, and he said, I will have to present data showing a connection between MMR vaccine and autism. And his name was taken off the roster. And onto the roster went the lead author, Dr. Frank Stefano, who got up there and lied. He presented the falsified data. He did not present the risk. The IOM produced a report which declared MMR vaccine safe. They went further. They said there should be no more funding given to vaccine safety research in light of this that criticizing federal employees and calling into account their integrity was unacceptable. And that report then went to the vaccine court. And in the vaccine court, there were 5,000 children, 5,000 plaintiffs who had developed autism after vaccinations. And all of those cases, based largely upon that report, were thrown out. 5,000 children were permanently denied any justice whatsoever in spite of a ruling by Congress in the National Vaccine Injury Act that they should re receive swift and just fair, fair compensation. That is the consequence of that fraud. William Thompson went quiet for many years, struggling with his conscience, wondering how to deal with this. Until last year, he contacted Brian Hooker and then me, and provided us with all this information. This is the documentary that we are now making, and it is an extremely powerful document. This is the worst medical fraud in the history of the world. 
Make no mistake about that. These are people who were charged with the welfare of every child in this country. This is not a drug company falsifying data about an, an anti-cancer therapy for end-stage terminal cancer. This is taking every healthy child in this nation and forcing them, mandating them, as now in California, to the exclusion of education to follow the CDC's vaccine schedule. And they knew and have known for 13 years that their schedule was putting millions of children in harm's way, leading to permanent brain damage. In this country, this year, there will be about 145,000 children diagnosed with autism. There were 644 cases last year of measles, not one case of encephalitis or death. 140,000 children condemned to a life of severe neurological impairment and lack of any independence. And what happens to those children when their parents die? What happens then? Because there is no infrastructure, none whatsoever, to take care of those people, and they will die on the streets. You will have heard the other day, just here in Austin, Texas, that a, an African-American young man, a gentle giant in a group home, four children, never heard anyone. Someone stepped on a DVD. He had a meltdown. He went round knocking on people's doors. He opened a door. He was shot four times and killed. That is the future. No. That is the present. And the future is going to be worse. So, something has to change. We're making this documentary on the basis that this must go back before Congress. This started with the Oversight Committee on Government Reform. It must go back there under Congressman Shabitz. At the moment, he is being prevailed upon by Bill Posey, Republican congressman from Florida. You may have seen him on C-SPAN the other day talking about this fraud. Watch that. Describing how they decided to destroy the documents, how they bought into the room a large trash can, took all the original documents from that study, and threw them into the tra trash can and destroyed them. That is a felony. Those documents were under FOIA request, they were under DOJ request, and they destroyed them. That is an imprisonable offense. And Dr. Thompson, in his wisdom and his concern, realized that that was an offense, and he kept copies, hard copies, and all the computer files which he provided to us. And so we wrote a formal complaint, and that formal complaint went to the CDC and the Office of Research Integrity. The CDC are trying to prevail upon uh, Congressman Shavitz's committee to let them investigate this internally. I can tell you, as a matter of fact, how's that going to go? Well, it's already gone, okay? I know what that report says. And they are already denying that that destruction of documents ever, ever took place. In other words, William Thompson is a liar. Okay, here's the anomaly, and that is that they don't have any documents. You show me yours, I'll show you mine. He's the only one with any documents. So if you haven't destroyed them, where are they? These people need to be brought to that committee. They need to testify under oath, and then they need to be prosecuted and go to prison. That's what needs to happen. And yet... And yet, there is huge lobbying right now by the pharmaceutical industry and the public health authorities to prevent that happening. It must happen. And it is the duty of every consumer, every citizen in this country, to make sure it happens. It must happen. So, and the government, I just put this in, as you know, the government have actually conceded in vaccine court that these vaccines can cause brain damage leading to autism, and this is a case they tried to hide, tried to cover up, tried to pull out of the vaccine injury compensation program polling, Hannah Polling, where her father is a neurologist, the government witness, who was a colleague of Dr. Polling's, Andrew Zimmerman, wrote in a paper that this was a consequence of the vaccine. And so here we have MMR vaccine causing autism. The government have accepted it, right? This is not my word, this is their word. So, I'm going to go through this very quickly. 
I want to talk about SB 277 very briefly. We will see this again. Californians allowed this to pass, and I presented Senator Pan with all of the information about the fraud, and yet he recklessly pushed through this bill in the certain knowledge that there was federal fraud into relation, in relation to the vaccine schedule that he was forcing on Californian children. And I believe that he, sh he should be held personally accountable for every child that is damaged from this point forward who is vaccinated as a result of his bill where the parents have said, I do not want my child vaccinated but have no choice. So he must be held personally accountable. The bill is being fought on the basis, and this is the fundamental plank of this, and this will come back to Texas and it will come to every other state. There's a federal bill being pushed through at the moment to mandate childhood vaccination. And there is an adult mandatory vaccination bill going through in California right now based upon the success of SB 277. So the future is cradle to grave mandatory immunization driven by the pharmaceutical industry. We will become human ATM machines for the pharmaceutical industry. That is their aim. And they have no care whatsoever about the consequences for the population. Why? Because they have no liability, as you know. They are exempt from any liability for a vaccine that is on the vaccine schedule as recommended by the CDC. It's being fought on the basis that it's safe and efficacious. Okay, these vaccines are safe and efficacious, and therefore, at a population level, the greater good means that we can force these vaccinations on children, irrespective of their parents' wishes. The mistake in California was that they fought against this bill on personal choice. Now, if you get into personal choice, which is absolutely fundamental, you are going to lose, because they have already made up their minds that the greater good excludes the lesser, that the choice of the group exceeds that of the individual. So you will lose because it's a debate. However, if you approach this on the basis that the vaccine is, let's just take MMR, not safe. There's a federal admission of fraud that says it's not safe. Then you cannot pass a bill mandating vaccines based upon the plank that it is safe and effective. So you must go right for the core of this issue and say they are neither safe nor are they effective. Now let's talk about the efficacy just briefly. This is a case filed by two whistleblowers, one of whom who came to me several years ago in Chicago, presented me with documents from Merck's vaccine lab. Steve Kralin. Kralin and Wichikowski against Merck. This is a case of fraud. The mumps vaccine in the MMR was not working. There were outbreaks of mumps in highly vaccinated populations around the world. Now, mumps in children is trivial. Mumps in post pubertal males is not trivial, it can lead to orchitis and sterility. There are now outbreaks of mumps in college populations and adult populations around the world because the, MMR, the, measles, the mumps component in the Merck vaccine and any other mumps vaccine does not work. Now, a vaccine that doesn't work, it produces protection in a minority or that protection wanes very quickly, turns a trivial disease into a dangerous disease. You've seen this with chickenpox. So you take a mild childhood disease and you turn it into a serious adult disease. That is the only thing that this vaccine has done. And it was introduced as a commercial imperative by Merck to actually secure a monopoly on measles vaccine coverage in this country. They were the only ones to have a mumps vaccine. They reasoned that if they could combine it into the MMR, and make that the vaccine of choice, they would put their competitors out of business, and that is ex exactly what has happened. So a bad vaccine is a dangerous vaccine. The CDC ruled when Morris Hilleman from Merck went to them that it was never needed. We've done a study, it's, just, it's a trivial disease in children, we don't need a mumps vaccine. So he went state by state, making sure that every state official introduced it. It's dangerous, it's a commercial strategy. This is an interview between Donald Henderson, who was the head of the World Smallpox Eradication Program and Patrick Tierney, an author. You were a very senior man at the CDC, Henderson. How do you feel about, for example, the introduction of the mumps vaccine? Has it been a success or not in your view? Was it necessary or not? No. That was another Merck ploy, which was rather clever. We had the measles rubella vaccine, the mumps vaccine came along, and Mori, that's Morris Hilleman, who developed the vaccine, was really gung-ho about getting mumps. Well, we looked at the data, and you know this isn't really a bad disease. The cost of this is minimal. 
why do we want to add a month's vaccine? So Murray got to a guy by the name of Feimster, Roy Feimster, who was uh, the, um, the health commissioner in Massachusetts. He persuaded him that all children in Massachusetts should have the mumps vaccine. So MMR came in at that point, and from then on, another state kind of joined in and another state, and finally, the CDC said, oh, to hell with it. Everyone's using it, so we might as well mandate it. This is the scientific basis for the introduction of mumps vaccine into the children in this country. An oh to hell with it call by the CDC. That's it. That's the science right there. Where do we go from here? Well, what happened subsequently is that um, Kralin came to me and gave me documents showing that why the vaccine wasn't working and what Merck intended to do about it. Now, when they were presented by the FDA with the notion that they would lose their license, in light of all these mumps outbreaks, if they could not prove that their vaccine was as efficacious as they said in the product insert, 96%, then they would lose their license. They had two choices. They could either improve the vaccine or they could fix the data in the interests of Merck. Which do you think they did? Yeah, it's rhetorical. So the first thing they did is they, the test is called a plaque reduction neutralization assay, PRN. It doesn't matter about the details, but it looks at the ability of the, the antibodies produced by the vaccine in children to neutralize the virus. And it's a laboratory test. The first thing they did is it didn't work against the wild mumps virus. It didn't show efficacy. That's the virus that you want to see protection against. That's what kids are getting, but it didn't work. So they were allowed by the FDA to substitute that virus for the weakened vaccine virus. So they cheated, but it still didn't work. It still didn't neutralize the damage caused by the weakened vaccine virus. So then they designed an assay, and the words are crucial because it's in the title of their document, but allowed permitted the detection of a 95% protection rate. What did they do? Does anyone know? What did they add to the test? Sorry? They added rabbit's blood. They added rabbit's blood to the test. It's a purely artifactual, non-specific effect. It was nothing to do with protection against mumps in children. They added rabbit's blood to the test and it produced an apparent seroconversion or produced immunity. And they were very pleased with that except that the way that you look at the efficacy of a vaccine is you take say a hundred children who've never been exposed to mumps, you take a blood sample, you then give them the vaccine and six weeks later you take a second blood sample and what you want to see in the laboratory is no antibodies, antibodies, zero conversion, protection. The problem is the rabbit's blood produced positive results in the pre-immune serum. So they were already immune. So they go from immune to immune in the laboratory test. So it was a failure. It was a bust. They cheated on multiple levels, and it was a bust. And at that stage, they simply told their scientists, Kralin and Wichkowski, to go away and cross out their data and put in new numbers. In fact, the arrogance of Merck is such that it was such a laborious process, it was so tedious and time consuming to do this that they developed a software package that put on the screen, highlighted the results they didn't want so that they could go through and change them systematically. Anyway, Steve Carlin was asked to change his data and he said no. That is fraud, and I'm not doing it. In fact, I'm going to go to my boss and talk to him about it. So he did, and his boss sent him to his boss's boss, Emilio Amini, who was head of the immunization di division in Merck. And, Mer and Amini said, hey, listen, this is a business decision. Look at this, okay? I mean, I don't know what he said precisely, but you can imagine the conversation goes something like this. Look, the vaccine doesn't work. Great, because then people need dose after dose after dose. They're going to have annual doses. The volume of sales will go like this. The irony is the vaccine is a huge commercial success precisely because it doesn't work. To hell with the children. That doesn't matter. This is a business decision. 
And Carlin said, well, I'm going to go to the FDA and report this. And he said, well, then you'll go to prison because you've signed an NDA. I said, I don't care. I'm going to go to the FDA anyway. So he went to the FDA, he called the FDA, and he said, I want to report a serious violation. And this is what it is. And the FDA were kind enough to call Merck and say, next week we're coming to do a surprise visit to your lab. <laughs> you can't write this stuff. I'm telling you, that is what happened. And that gave them time to destroy the offending evidence, except for the fact that Kralin had already secured that evidence. And that is now in federal court in Pennsylvania, where Merck are being sued for defrauding the government under the Whistleblower Act. The judge was recently prevailed upon to have the case thrown out, not upon the basis that they didn't commit fraud, because their senior scientist who conducted the fraud admitted it in deposition. So they said, well, yeah, okay, but the FDA knew about it, so it's okay. Well, actually, the FDA knew some of it and was complicit, but didn't know all of it. And the judge said, no way, you're going to trial. So that's where it stands at the moment. So we come back to SB 277. There you have the two planks of mandatory vaccination, safety and efficacy. And yet with just one vaccine, you have federal admission of fraud and corporate admission of fraud, just one vaccine. And in those circumstances, irrespective of the need for personal choice, you cannot even begin to countenance the notion of mandating the CDC's vaccine schedule in this country or indeed any country. And that is the plank upon which it must be fought. So I probably, I don't know how we're doing for time. How are we doing for time? Pat hasn't held up. 30 minutes. Oh, good Lord, I'm going to take questions, I think, because I've always run out. But um, uh, after my career sort of took a downturn and ended up in the toilet, I um, eventually became a filmmaker because over the years I'd heard so many extraordinary stories that needed to be told. And so um, I had to find a way of continuing to fight this fight, and, and filmmaking was one of them. It's not a it's not a happy thing. It's not an easy thing. The first story we made was about a child in Chicago who um, really is, I suppose, Robert Louis Stevenson, the author of Treasure Island, said once, we must, sooner or later, we must all sit down to a feast of consequences. And this documentary we're making at the moment was originally called Feast of Consequences. But it's a we are now going to have to sit down to a feast of consequences. And the last documentary we made was one such consequence. This is a little boy called Alex Bordelakis, who made the national news. And he was extremely sick. Uh, he developed autism after the MMR vaccine. And he was put on a gluten-free, casein-free diet. He did extremely well for many years until the doctor said, there's no need for that. Put him back on regular food. And gradually, he deteriorated and became increasingly disturbed and violent. The response and the, the violence was due in large part to abdominal pain from his intestinal inflammation. The response of the medical profession, child psychiatrist, was to put him on psychotropic medication. Not one, but many, one after another. In total, 25 drugs, only two of which were licensed by the FDA for the treatment of behaviors in autism. Now, here's another irony. You guys, me, we're called quacks. Okay, that's what we are, we're quacks. <laughs> Who's the quack? Who's the quack? The child psychiatrist who experiments with 23 medications that are not licensed, alone and in combination in a child like this, with no science whatsoever behind it. Who's the quack? So, this child, despite being medicated, became increasingly violent, was admitted to many hospitals in Chicago, was denied gastrointestinal investigation because the doctor said, if we heal the brain, that will heal the bowel. It's a senior gastroenterologist who features in the film. Uh, the mother was eventually taken to New York where he was scoped by Dr. Arthur Kriegsman, had intestinal inflammation, but once again went back to a child neurologist who stopped the medication for his inflammatory bowel disease and put him on powerful antibiotics, which caused, as it does often in Crohn's disease, a recurrence, a re recrudescence of the inflammation. 
He was admitted to Lutheran Hospital in Chicago where he was put on, in the pediatric intensive care unit, he was put on two intravenous drugs and one intramuscular drug, ketamine, which as you know is a veterinary anesthetic, a powerful hallucinogen. And he destroyed the room. He was in four point restraint for over 70 days. And then insurance ran out. He was in the pediatric intensive care unit. He was in four point restraint. He had two intravenous and one intramuscular medication. And the, fi and the money ran out. The insurance company said that's it. And the hospital turned him out on the street. Turned him out on the street. And a week later, he was dead. He had been stabbed to death by his mother. And his mother and godmother had entered into a murder-suicide pact where they had tried to kill themselves. I suppose, sadly, in some way, they could no longer bear to see, to witness his suffering. And they had nowhere to go and nowhere to get any respite or solace or sleep or comfort or anything whatsoever from the tragedy of this little boy. And so um, they are now in Cook County maximum security awaiting sentencing for murder. And the value of the documentary is that it told that story. And it's now been seen by the lawyers for both sides. And they're deeply conflicted because what is clear from this documentary is the extraordinary love that that mother and godmother had for that child and what they went through and what they were driven to the point when they finally decided that none of them could stand this suffering any longer. And this is a sin that is wholly at the door of the medical profession, entirely at the door of the medical profession. And that is the reason for making the film. So not a happy film. Not a happy ending, but I think one that people should see if you are to understand what the future of this world looks like if we do not act. It's called Who Killed Alex Bordelakis? And uh, you can watch it on Amazon or get a DVD. And so now we are making the documentary which has been changed from Feast of Consequences to CDC Whistleblower. And I think after the break, there will be some discussion of that and I'll show you some clips from that documentary and some of the people that we've interviewed for that. It's a very, very powerful story that, as I say, relates the history of the greatest medical fraud ever perpetrated on this planet. So I think what I'll do now is take some questions from anybody and um, I don't know how you want to do this through... Just make sure you repeat the question. I'll repeat the question, okay, if I can hear it in the first place. Please. I'm as deaf as a post, as we say in England, so <laughs> shout it out, okay? I'm also a, a male, I, and I have a male brain, therefore, if you ask me three questions at once, I'll forget what the last two were, so <laughs> ask me one at a time. This lady was first. Hi. Well, I think what needs to happen needs to happen at a federal level. You would need to eliminate Senator Pan and all these people from the equation completely. The Government Oversight Committee needs to hear this. They need to hear that there's been fraud, and they need to take a decision at a congressional and ultimately an executive level to stop any mandatory vaccination bill pending an inquiry into this uh, fraud and to revoke, to recall any bill that has been passed in the interim, particularly in the light of the fact that it was passed in the certain knowledge by Dr. Pan and his colleagues that this fraud had taken place. And there needs to be an independent inquiry into that. So I do not think this is, there's any point in fight, fighting this necessarily at the state level other than to use legal redress to prevent it. And I'm not a lawyer, so I can't tell you how that might go down. But I would most certainly insist that this goes before the Oversight Committee. That's the only way in which we're going to stop this um, runaway train from damaging more children. So that would be my approach. Um, there was, who was next? I'm so sorry. I, I was told to repeat the question. That's what I mean when I got a male brain. I was told to repeat the <laughs> You see how, I mean, it's a struggle. I really, you don't know, you ladies, what a struggle it is. I'm, the question was, what happens next if the, there's a referendum in California to, um, to, to undo what has been done in SB 277. If that fails, what is the next step? 
So that was the question. Right, I'm not going to forget. Remind me. Don't throw something at me if I forget. This. Now, there's a gentleman here, and then there's a gentleman at the back, and then the lady at the front. So, yes, sir. It's a very, it's a very good question. So this gentleman has a son with Asperger's, high-functioning autism spectrum disorder, ha who has been investigated for his GI problems, has been treated, has been on the diet, has done very well, but still has some residual OCD problems. I think the success of any intervention, be it homeopathy or, or, or in sort of what you call mainstream, I'm not sure what mainstream medicine is anymore, but mainstream medical intervention is that the earlier you get children, the better. And I don't know when you intervene, but the more you can produce a more dramatic effect, the younger you get the children. Again, this is sort of intuitive. There is an element of residual encephalopathy or brain injury, I think, in many of these children, so that they get to a certain point and then they plateau. It's up to us as, as physicians, scientists, to try and understand what more we can do to improve that. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't anything. I'm sure there is. What happened to me is that I was kind of moved out of the scientific arena a few years ago and have perhaps not kept up as well as I should, but there are there is an abundance of literature in, out there now, the merits of micronutrient supplementation, vitamin B12, all of these things, and reduction of the inflammatory process or the ongoing inflammatory process. It's my perception of this that it's in a, a problem of, of, of immune regulation, probably one might say a, a sort of autoimmune type condition. And you don't cure those, but you can certainly attenuate them, you can ameliorate them, but they will, yeah, they will wax and wane. That is the nature of Crohn's or multiple sclerosis or any of these things. So there will be periods when it's worse, periods when it's better. And that may reflect the fact that there is ongoing inflammation or problems. And so I would say that the diet has to be 100% gluten casein free. What I've often found is that children plateau on that after improving, and then there is something else in the diet that needs to be excluded. As you all know, that wheat now is highly toxic, given the fact that much of it derives from failed GMO experiments. So the gluten is almost indigestible and highly allergenic, so that one can't pay too much attention to dietary intervention. And I wish I could be more specific than that, but there will be an abundance of literature out there on what to do. And Autism One is probably the website of Autism One is the place to go because that's where the cutting edge experimental alternative approaches are really being explored. And so I would, I would go to that website. So now, um, this gentleman at the back, right, this gentleman's a pediatrician, gives an alternative vaccination schedule which delays it and um, sees good neurological outcomes from that. Is that I've understood that correctly. And, and uh, deals with a lot of children with autism spectrum disorders. Are there any vaccines that are safe and effective? You know, when I got into this, following the parent's story, it was MMR. Then I came to the States and I discovered thimerosal. Now I discover aluminum and formaldehyde and fetal, uh, aborted fetal cells and porcine circovirus type 1 and 2 in the, in the Merck rotavirus vaccine, and so the more you discover, the more you realize that the answer is fundamentally no. No. And firstly, I, I commend you for modifying the schedule, and it goes very much along with what the CDC found, is that if they delayed the MMR until after three years of life, they saw a highly significantly reduced risk of autism. So they had the option not to stop the vaccine, but to merely delay it and prevent a whole lot of damage. And they didn't even do that. Liz Mumper, a pediatrician from Virginia, does exactly what you do, and she delays the schedule, and she has reported on that in many of her patients in a study, showing that there, is, there are no obvious adverse neurological outcomes in her patients. So there are things that can be done, even if you want to continue vaccinating. Now you may argue that the notion of protection of children against serious infectious disease using a safe and effective approach is a laudable goal. And I'm sure that's something that you guys have been discussing here this weekend. 
but none of the vaccines on the current schedule meet those criteria. And therefore, and I can only say this from people say to me, what would you do? What should we do? And I say, the only thing I can tell you, I'm not going to tell you what to do with your children, but the only honest answer I can give is that what would I do for my child? And if I had a baby now, I would not vaccinate them. And I would not do so until the proper science is done that I can actually believe in that shows what is safe and effective. And the commercial imperative to alter the facts and to coerce pediatricians, and I feel very sorry for pediatricians in many cases because they have been put in an invidious position. They should, in many cases, also have done their homework, and they're too happy to go along with the Kool-Aid, but nonetheless, um, uh, this is being driven by a huge conglomerate, a huge pharmaceutical industry interest that is only driven by the bottom line and is not concerned with the health of this nation whatsoever. In terms of medical, this is an ethical question. Is it ethical in terms of what we've learned from the Nuremberg trials and the code that emerged from that? Is it ethical to mandate anything in medicine, let alone vaccines? No, is the answer, absolutely not. Where there is risk, there must be choice. And no medical procedure is out without risk. In fact, the risk for vaccines is clearly demonstrable. So should you coerce people in any way, in any shape, manner, or form, in the absence of fully informed consent, to be vaccinated? Absolutely not. It must remain a matter of choice. And it's unacceptable to me that medicine should be, and this is again driven by the pharmaceutical industry interest, through people like Senator Pan, who has hoard himself to that interest, to make sure that this happens for their interest. Um, it is absolutely unacceptable that you can force any medical procedure onto anyone. And um, this is highlighted by the danger of that. The danger of that approach is highlighted by the CDC whistleblower story. They took a decision. I believe they must have sat down and decided, look, the greater truth excludes the lesser. We are in this room prepared to accept some collateral damage, autism, because we believe fundamentally, really, religiously, in vaccination. Moreover, our jobs and our livelihoods depend upon it. And if that's what they decided, then they made a disastrous, disastrous choice. And I don't really care what motivated them. They need to go to prison for that. But we hold, need to hold this up as an example of why anything that violates patient trust and the Nuremberg Code and fully informed parental consent is totally unacceptable in medical practice. Um, there was someone here, was it, was it you first? Someone first here? What? 10 minutes, 10 minutes, okay. Uh, yes, this lady here, then that lady there, and then there was someone here, okay? So one, two, three, okay. Are Crohn's disease and osteocolitis vaccine injuries? I, um, this is really where I started in, in the late 1980s, 1990 at the Royal Free Hospital. We did a series of studies that looked at the relationship between atypical patterns of measles infection and Crohn's disease. So we did some studies it, with, the, with a Swedish group now at the Karolinska showing that mothers who had measles during pregnancy a re very rare event because mothers had almost invariably had measles as children, had children who had a very, very high risk of Crohn's. Of the four cases of measles in thousands and thousands of births in Sweden, three of the offspring went on to develop Crohn's disease at the age of 30, very severe Crohn's disease. The odds of that are six million to one. So we published all these papers in The Lancet. We showed that early exposure to measles is a risk and when you've got it, determined whether you've got Crohn's or colitis. And that was all very, very interesting. And then we did a study, which we all pub also published in The Lancet, showing in a longitudinal birth cohort that if you had measles vaccine compared with measles, you were at three times greater risk of Crohn's and colitis. So the data were extremely interesting. 
And then someone came along in London and looked at aluminum and found that aluminum exposure may be related to Crohn's. And were these two mutually exclusive? No, because aluminum is an adjuvant in vaccines that boosts the immune response. So if you have an atypical exposure to an infection plus aluminum, you have a potentiation of the risk of an adverse reaction to that infectious agent. So all of that was extremely interesting. And then it got usurped by looking at the inflammatory bowel disease in children with autism, and then I lost my job and got thrown out of it. So it kind of died a death there. But I just read a paper the other day that linked MMR vaccine to Crohn's disease in Poland, I believe it was, and one which did the same in, in Israel. So it's very interesting. It's still an open question. It seems that we've seen an epidemic of inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's in particular, in children. It was unheard of before the 1960s, and then suddenly it went up. So that was my original work. Can I say definitively that vaccines are linked with these disorders? No, but certainly there is reason to be concerned. Yes, for those of you who don't know this story, um, there have been a number of physicians in alternative medicine and those involved in alternative approaches to cancer therapy and inflammatory, uh, sorry, and autism who have been killed in recent months, a growing number. And there are some common denominators to those deaths. Some are clear murder, some are death under very strange circumstances. And one of the first people to be killed was a friend of mine, a friend of yours, called Jeff Bradstreet. And Jeff had done a lot of work in the field of autism. He himself had a, an autistic child. He was found in a river with a bullet wound in his chest. And police said, no suspicious circumstances are, are suspected. I mean, absolutely extraordinary. Let me ask you, let me put this to you, that if you look at suicide and you look at the number of people who commit suicide by shooting themselves in the chest, very, very small. If you look at suicide in physicians, then that number is zero. And this was murder. It was clearly murder. Why Jeff was murdered, I don't know. But Jeff, when I last met him at Autism One in May, had some very exciting information that he was about to share. And that information, it seems, was in conflict well, in, with the interests of other people, um, particularly those in the field of cancer therapy. Now, this is all, at the moment, circumstantial, except, of course, the fact that he was killed. Um, other physicians have disappeared or died in similar circumstances. And uh, there appears to be, I mean, Sherlock Holmes said that once a coincidence, twice never. This is not a coincidence. So um, that is what we currently face. What can we do to protect ourselves against it? Well, is it going to influence anything I do? No. Um, Nelson Mandela, in his trial, before going into solitary confinement for 27 years, said some ideals are worth dying for. And it's my fundamental belief, not heroic, but just my belief that the children of this country are worth dying for. And so if that becomes necessary, well, so be it. I've lived a privileged life. I don't have any qualms about continuing to do what I do, but I most certainly am not going to back down in the face of threats or coercion from what I'm currently doing. And what I found dealing with whistleblowers over the years is the safest thing that you can do is get their name out there as widely as possible. And this is what we did with William Thompson. And we were criticized for this by the autism community. But Jeff Bradstreet's death characterizes that par excellence. Because Jeff had a story to tell, and we never get, got to find out what that story was. And whistleblowers are in great danger when the only ones who know their story are their enemies. And that is something in The Insider, the movie about tobacco litigation that came across very, very clearly. So there comes a point when you have to decide as someone who is hearing their story when they are better off in the public domain. And it's my sincere belief that William Thompson is now much safer because he is a public figure. So 
How do we protect ourselves? I don't know, because the people with whom we're dealing do not threaten. There are no threats. It just happens. So we just, as far as I'm concerned, just continue to do what we're doing. Is there an FBI investigation? I don't know. There most certainly should be. Uh, but I believe there is going to be some network documentary investigation, and that will be extremely interesting. Uh, yes, this lady down here. Yes, are there any political initiatives to change what is going on? Um, political initiatives are really driven by the consumer, by the public, and they need, therefore, we need, every single one of us needs to act to make sure that our congressman, our individual representative, is aware that we need to have, in this instance, Dr. Thompson brought before the Oversight Committee on Government Reform. That is absolutely essential, and to fight vaccine mandates at every level, every time they rear their head. That has got to happen. So. It's up to the, ele the individuals to prevail upon their elected representatives to do their job properly, and that's where it begins and ends. It's our job. Thank you very much. That's the This is the biggest issue in America today, for the very reasons that I've shown you. One in two by 2032, if nothing is done. It doesn't matter about foreign policy. It doesn't matter about the budget. It doesn't matter about the economy. It doesn't matter about schooling. Nothing matters when one in two individuals in this country have autism. It just comes to a grinding halt, and that's happening now. So in the next election, irrespective of what your previous political affiliations may have been, you have got to vote for the person who is going to do this, who's going to act on this in your interests and not in the interests of the pharmaceutical industry. Okay? This must be the issue upon which you vote. Because if you don't, then all those other things have no meaning for the future. And you will see in the other day in the, um, the GOP sort of uh, debate, it's absolutely fascinating that someone planted a question about vaccination and autism risk, which was intended specifically to isolate and discredit Donald Trump, who has been outspoken on this issue. And what happened in that debate is that having reiterated, having not backed down from his position that vaccines too many be given too soon and they are undoubtedly related to autism, they turned to the two doctors who were candidates, Carson and Rand Paul. And they expected them to belittle and isolate Trump, and they did exactly the opposite. Carson said, we are giving too many vaccines too soon, and that there are some vaccines on the schedule are totally unnecessary. And Paul said, it is not. It is not up to the government to determine what the parents should be entitled to determine, and that is vaccination of their children. So it completely and utterly backfired. And you can be really sure that some Democrat, some lobbyist who put that question there to damage Trump lost his job that day, and so he deserved it. So this is now firmly on the political agenda, and it's not going to go away. It's not going to go away, and it's not going to go away because we're not going to let it go away, okay? But believe me, this is, for America, the most important issue in the next election. And I don't know much about Donald Trump, but if he's the guy who is going to solve this problem, or Carson, who's going to solve this problem, or Rand Paul, then they would get my vote. Because they are prepared to stand up for the people against corporate interests, irrespective of their views on immigration or anything else. Nothing else matters when the children of this country are so profoundly compromised that the future looks extremely bleak. Now, the other thing you can do is to help us finish this documentary. And it's very rare and somewhat embarrassing to ask for financial help, but this, this documentary is so, so important. And we are now very close to getting the production on this documentary finished. It features a Nobel laureate. It features two well-known 
television doctors taking a huge risk to go on this documentary to tell, what, tell the world what their position is. It is a very, very important story. <laughs>